This is Robert Galarowitz, naturopath, nutritionist, 19 years with a kidney transplant. I've got a special guest today is Stephen McConnell, a lipidemiologist, a kidney researcher, also published in the Townsend Letter, 25 case studies on reversing kidney disease. So very happy that you're here and thank you, you know, for joining me today. Good to be here. We're probably gonna do a few of these, but we're talking about niacin today. Now, just in my experience, niacin is a tremendous, tremendous nutrient, which has so many benefits. Oh, yeah. to these. And it doesn't matter what study I looked up, it always shown benefit. And it has a tremendous amount of benefit in cardiovascular health. Yeah, I, the um, studies I've seen. So yeah, I want you to discuss it today. Your thoughts also in a little controversial work that came out that I don't think means much, but you know, we'll talk about that too. So feel free to tell me about tell us about niacin and everyone. The controversial work created more work for me because I only deal with facts and truth. And when I see a horribly constructed publication, I have to dissect it. And then, of course, every patient I know, and there are many, I have to reassure them and deprogram them for what they read. I'll say this bluntly. Cleveland Clinic created a huge amount of damage for the patient population that's taking niacin. And that includes people who take NAD or any form of niacin. They couldn't be further from the truth, but we'll get into that later. We have a rebuttal being put together and there's about 10 extremely famous people I'm reaching out to today. Dr. Castelli, Framingham Study, Dr. Saperko, Dr. Guyton, pretty much every med student had to buy his textbook and there's a list. None of them have abandoned niacin and none of them agree with that publication. And, and we're talking decades and decades and I mean tens of thousands of studies that should that have been supporting niacin in, in cardiovascular health. So, Well, I could say this and I'm usually long-winded but this is a rare moment when I use a short number of words. Follow the money. I remember the Watergate trial and they had this guy in deep throat who was an informant, but he realized that there was a crime being committed by the Republican Party, Richard Nixon. And um, he told them without naming names how to find the evidence. Well, there's two schools of thought. This complete derangement and the appreciation of niacin and claiming it doesn't have a benefit or it's dangerous. You know, you can't use it with peptic ulcer. It's risky in an atrial fib patient. There's a very short list. And in my experience, and we're talking several thousand patients on niacin, I've only seen one, two, maybe 3% that shouldn't be on niacin. And then I won't do it. And it makes my job harder because it's really a shotgun. It doesn't fire a single bullet. It fires a scatter of pellets and it hits everything in the body. 400 100 genes require niacin in the body, so it has to have niacin. And that there is no other molecule uh, that has that status. There's some that affect a lot of genes, but not as many as niacin. And the quote is, follow the money, because there's two things in play here. You could say it's more complicated, but greed and ignorance. And the AIM High and the HPS2 Thrive studies, I think there was a fair amount of ignorance. And that's probably in play this time around. But who would benefit by niacin being repositioned off the radar and everyone told to not be on it? Probably yeah. people will make money on something else that niacin competes yeah. with. Niacin has always been a competitor. It was the first drug all by itself, not in combination, to lower heart attack 27%, ischemic stroke 24%. And in diabetics, the combined cardiovascular outcomes, including mortality, was 50 Four percent lower in diabetics. That's in conflict with what many people believe and don't know much about niacin. We're not talking and, one study. You know, we're we're not we're not talking like just one public. No, that's the first ah. study, and that was the first yeah. ever study to reduce heart attack. It was niacin. They completed it the year I graduated from high school, seventy three, and that tells you how old I am. But um, I remember when I was trained to work clinically, have an advanced degree. I'm not an MD, but I had to put open heart patients on life support and anesthesia when I trained at Columbia Presbyterian in New York City. My first uh, case was with Dr. Oz, of all people. What a nice guy, good teacher. Anyway, when I started doing a lot of cases, a really smart doctor in my hometown, he had the lowest morbidity and mortality. If you wanted a valve replacement, you went to him, Dr. Tan. He mentioned niacin. 
this is probably 91, 92. He said, it's pretty much the only thing we know that'll reverse it. Now, statins were still fairly new. There were a couple other cholesterol drugs, but before the statin, niacin in combination with anything, one other or two other medications, always lowered the cardiac events, dramatically reduced the need for interventional cardiac surgeries, you know, stents and open heart and just all kinds of other endpoints. And it's still today, still the only monotherapy that moves all the lipoproteins, the cholesterol particles. Cholesterol is not the player, it's the particles, particularly when they're modified, damaged, oxidized. All the bad ones go down and all the good ones go up. Plus, in opposition with Dr. Hazen in the Cleveland Clinic, it's fabulous anti-inflammatory. There's a list of about 10 different markers you want to reduce and it lose them all down it does that's tremendous tremendous benefits and oh. i've seen this clinically myself and and lots of people's blood work you know so so you know we, we know that it's excellent it's great for the heart what does it do for the kidney well we probably will never know the complete list and that's the interesting thing with niacin when you research it niacin probably gets researched more times in a year than any other single search word why is that because it's shrinking glioblastomas in the brain it's repairing damage to the insulation on your nerve fibers you name it it does it parkinson's heart disease kidney disease well kidney disease i saw a study i think it was 1991 omada a japanese researcher he found out that not only did niacin and lower phosphorus, but it was anti-proteinuric. What does that mean? Well, the two best ways to determine you have kidney disease aren't signs and symptoms. It's largely sim- symptomless for quite a while. But cystatin C, which is a blood marker, it's far better than creatinine. I may or may not get into that. And you measure urine. Most people what aren't are using that. The urine? No, most doctors I know. aren't. So. Well, niacin lowers phosphorus. Antiproteinuria for the layman means your kidney's filter is no longer fully functional. It's damaged and it's leaking protein and the pores change sizes and there's little podocytes. Imagine my hands are holding back a sheet of saran wrap. But when the podocytes get truncated or they're further apart, the hydrostatic pressure on both sides of that membrane can allow things to pass through that shouldn't and things that you want to pass through don't. And that's a problem. So if you want to know you got kidney disease, tell your doctor, I'm not content with the creatinine. I want you to check my urine. If the protein's high, then ask for the cystatin C because it's only 13, maybe 15 bucks. Depends on the lab. Here's the problem. Creatinine is so horrible, 27% are under-evaluated. What I mean is they're underscored for it's loss not a, of function. It's not a reliable they, marker. Yeah, it, it'll say you're 0, 1, or maybe 2, and you're actually 3A, 3B, or 4. And it doesn't become uh, reliable till 3B. And we've all known this for a long time. And when they put a number on it, I asked the guy from Gentian, I said, I'm guessing most of that 20% cover stage 1 and 2. And he said, yes. <laughs> and labs say... Anything greater than 50 is normal. Well, that's not true. Greater than 90 is normal, excluding hyperfiltration. We don't need to get into that. But that means you're skipping stage one and two and not identifying it until they're 3A or 3B. And so statin C will catch those people because it doesn't have 12 formulas like creatinine does. Mm -hmm. It has one. And actually now they're saying we should order both the creatinine and statin C. And the combination, there's a little calculation. It's a ratio. Will tell you what the true GFR is. And the GFR just means glomerular infiltrate filtration rate. Glomerular filtration rate. And that just means how good is your are your kidneys filtering? In other words, the production goes in decline when the filter is no longer functioning normally. And that's a blood measurement. And you combine that with a urine measurement. Now you've got an accurate stage. Yeah, and they're two separate things. But uh, niacin is antiproteinuric in as little as a tenth. A tenth, one tenth of a gram, 100 milligrams. And they've used it up to many studies are doing 1500 milligrams, 2000 milligrams. But as those low doses, it wouldn't affect a lot of cardiovascular parameters, but it'll lower the phosphorus almost as good as most of these chelators, which are prescription. And they cost anywhere from a hundred dollars to a thousand dollars a month, which is insane. Now you know? it, it lowers phosphorus. It, it also, protein it's area. St- right? Protein it, area. It's it improves the GFR. Very cost effective. It's, so. Yes, it's five cents a gram. Now, let me put a caveat out here. Don't go using niacin without finding an expert. Your first question is to the provider. 
or, or locate me and I'll try to help you. But uh, if the provider never uses niacin or not very often, he has a high failure rate or is against its use, walk away. Find a lipidologist. And the first question is, how often do you use niacin? Okay. With all your patients on a statin, and pretty much all of them are, except for those who couldn't tolerate it or they have a fear of statins, all your statin patients, for every 100, how many of those are on niacin? If they say anything less than 30%, keep looking. I have all my patients on niacin. There's a few I won't use it on, or there's a few that I couldn't get up to uh, what I consider the therapeutic threshold, but that's okay. I compromise. I, I'm not a bully. If you take 500 milligrams a day, that's beneficial, especially with kidneys. 